The Sound of Magic, Book Two, Chapter Five. Come and have a snack, you two, said Grand Louise, gesturing to the empty chairs around the table. We pulled them out and sat down as she bustled around the kitchen. Think hard before you say yes to Mr. Malvey, Grand Louise told Serge. Zombies is no place for a child your age. Serge nodded respectfully but said nothing. I wondered what he was thinking. If Serge was determined as I was, nothing would change his mind. Still, I gave one additional warning. If you go to the audition, you might have to face the Lugaloo, I said with a shudder. And it could gobble you up. After being still for a beat, Serge swatted the air. On the mother wiles, that's just the sort of thing adults tell kids to keep them from staying up too late, he said. Gwen Louise came over with a bowl of plantain chips and a couple of bottles of mango juice. She handed one to Serge, who took a sip. Gwen Louise joined us at the table and explained what Serge would actually face. The Lugaloo is an evil spirit, a stowaway from the mother wiles. Legend says it can sense the creative energy that swirls inside every child. The greedy Lugaloo feeds on this energy, drawing it out of children as easily as sipping milk from a straw, she said. I shuddered, and out of the corner of my eye I saw Serge do the same. It's the reason I never ventured out on a full moon night when I was a young girl, Gwen Louise continued. I didn't want to lose my creative energy. I imagine that would feel a little like being in an ocean without rushing waves. Gwen Louise even has an old magical amulet that she wore when she was young. It wards off the Lugaloo on full moon nights, I said, pointing to the rope necklace hanging from a hook on the back of the front door. The amulet looked like a small polished egg and had a single hole through its centre. I hope no one will ever need it, said Gwen Louise, but we keep it around just in case. Well, Mr Malvey didn't talk to me about any Lugaloo, said Serge. He's interested in my drumming. Not my ghost busting. You're new to Tropperville, so you're still learning about the people here, said Gran Louise. It's true, Mr. Malvey is well known and maybe even well respected. But he's a tricky fella, and everything he does comes at a cost. She stood up and collected our empty bottles. You could fill a subway car with all the musicians he's used up. It's almost as though he sucks the joy right out of them. Most of them don't even play anymore. I don't trust him one bit, she said. The bottles clinked together as Grand Louise dropped them into the recycling bin. I took the plantain bowl and gave it a quick rinse while Serge nudged the chairs back under the table. Come now, Josie, Grand Louise said after we'd finished cleaning up. Let's get you measured for your carnival costume. OK, I said. I walked Serge to the door and reminded him about my dance audition one last time. I'll meet you by the lockers after school and we'll walk over together. Don't worry, I got you he called as he walked down the hallway. Josie, you should tell your parents about your new drummer friend, Grand Louise said. It was just after dinner when my whole family was in the kitchen. Even though I faced the sink, rinsing dishes and loading them into the dishwasher, I knew that my parents' faces were beaming. Is he a musician? Like you, Mum said, unable to hide the excitement in her voice. How well can he play? asked Dad, leaning forward in his chair. The tip of my nose began to tickle. I knew exactly why my parents were asking these questions. They were hoping that by hanging out with a musician, I would suddenly want to give up dance and join a band. Serge is amazing, and yes, he's a musician. I wiped my forearm across my itchy nose. I had to change the subject. You're all acting like making a friend is the biggest news since the corner store ran out of chicken patties. They're back in, by the way. No, it's just that it's nice that you have someone your own age to hang out with. Wait! Mum stopped. The chicken patties are back. Yes! I did a little happy dance, my hands still dripping. Go, Josie! Grand Louise cheered. Mum started clapping along with my footfalls. Dad slapped the table and the percussive rhythms harmonised with Mum's hand claps. As I danced, I grabbed a spoon and fork from the sink and knocked them together to make a high-pitched clinking sound that ran out above it all. Grand Louise couldn't resist gracing our sounds with her honey-coated voice. Someone, someone your age, someone, someone your age. Our makeshift family band knew just when to wrap up our song. Right after Grand Louise cycled through her lyrics one more time, Dad banged out a finale that had us whooping and cheering. Everything felt right in my world. 
Making music with my family was fun, but as much as I loved these kitchen jam sessions, they didn't compare to how I felt when I danced, because when I danced, I felt like I could fly. Chapter 6 The minute I got home from Josie's house, I was met with glowering accusing eyes. I puffed out my chest and stared right back just as I slept. You're the one who owes me an explanation, I said to my cat. Don't think I didn't see you out there, spying on me. Meow. Mimi circled my legs, curling around my ankles as I bent over to scratch behind her ears. I headed to my room and Mimi followed close behind. She leapt gracefully to the top of the scratching post in the furthest corner of my room. Ready to hear what I've been working on lately? I asked her. I didn't know why I was talking to Mimi so much. Maybe it had something to do with today not being rotten egg smelly like the other days had been since I moved here. I'd made a friend, and I'd been scouted by a real music producer. I pulled a tiny fold-up stool from under my bed and set it up by the scratching post. I started drumming, trying the same beat compos I'd played earlier while Josie danced. I closed my eyes and drummed until sweat prickled at my forehead. I imagined I was back on the island, on Granny's back patio, where I used to sit and play for her. It felt so much like being there, I could practically smell the ocean breeze. Even Mimi was there, meowing along with my tropical jam session. Meow, now, now! My eyes shot open, and I half expected to see Mimi standing on her hind legs talking to me. But it was just my mum and pops. I haven't even heard them come home. My little sister, Naomi, kangaroo hopped into my room and waved at me, and hopped right back out. Serge, that is entirely too loud, Mum said from the doorway. She rubbed her temple like she already had a headache. How many times do I have to remind you that we have neighbours? I'm sorry, I said. Mum just sighed. Anyway, how was your day? She asked. Did you make any friends at school yet? Pops chimed in. I almost said no as a reflex. It was my usual answer. But today had been something different, something special. Actually, I did. Both my parents' faces lit up. It was nice to see them so happy for me. Suddenly, I wanted to share more about what had happened today. Her name's Josie. I also got to meet her grandmother. She's Granny's favourite singer. Sounds like you ran into Louise Lamore, Pop said. I also met Mr Marlborough. He's the biggest music producer in town. And guess what? He wants me to join a band called Zombies. Joining a band doesn't sound like a good idea, Mum said slowly. What about your schoolwork? Mum's mood sank faster than the Titanic. Drumming is the only thing that makes me happy, I said louder than I meant to. I folded my arms. Granny would understand. Your grandmother is wonderful, but she's filled your head with impractical dreams, which is her job as a doting grandmother, said Pops. Our job is to teach you about more practical goals. I don't want to be practical, I shouted. I want to do what I love. Mum sighed. We want that too, Serge. But we also want you to be able to pay the bills when you get older. That's why we brought you here from the Mother Isles, so you can eventually make a living for yourself. I said nothing, feeling defeated. After dinner, I told everyone I was off to bed early. But in my room, I stuffed my pillows underneath my blanket so it looked like I was asleep. I crawled out the window and down the fire escape. Meow! Mimi called from the window the minute I set foot on the ground. Go back inside! I hissed at her. Even though it was 8pm, the streets of Tropperville were still lively. I walked past the corner store and caught a whiff of the chicken patties Josie had introduced me to. Also wafting from the store was island music. Plinks of the steel pan drum tickled my ear. I crossed the intersection and decided to head down to the docks where the elegant ship set sail for the Mother Isles. Even though I'd flown to the mainland, going back and forth by boat had become popular among visitors because it took three days to get here from Madon, the largest island. Many people treated the trip like a cruise vacation. To get to Granny's home on La Marise, the smallest of the 19 island chain, you'd have to catch a two-hour ferry ride from Madon. It was far, and the long empty horizon in front of me made it seem even further. I turned to leave and spotted Mr Malvey. He stood a few docks over, gazing out at the water, I didn't want to disturb him, but I knew that I needed to take this chance before it was gone. I walked over. 
Mr. Malvey? Hello. I greeted him. He looked surprised to see me. Serge, my good friend, what are you doing out on these docks? I like to come here because the water reminds me of the mother whales. I miss them a lot, I said. Mr. Malvey nodded. The islands are an easy place to miss. My granny's there, I told him. She raised me and loved hearing me play. I see. And the people you live with now don't? He asked. I didn't respond, but Mr. Malvey saw the answer on my face. Serge, my offer to you still stands. You are such a talented drummer, and I'm prepared to offer you the kind of money that will let you save up for whatever destinations your talent will take you to, he said, following my gaze to a departing ship. And if I'm correct, a boy of your calibre could handle a playing position with zombies. I lifted my chin and looked up at him. I'll be at the audition tomorrow night. Thank you, Mr. Malvey. Smart young man, Mr. Malvey said and grinned at me and strolled away down the dock. My bad mood lifted and I raced back home with a spring in my step. Tropperville really was a musical town. Plus, I had two gigs lined up. Josie's audition, my audition for Mr. Malvey, and I was looking forward to them both. Chapter 7 It was the day of my dance audition, but I was trying not to think about it. During school lunch, I sat at the far end of the cafeteria table full of chatty sixth graders. I focused on their babble, distracting myself from thinking about how much I wanted to perform at Carnival this year. I was nibbling on a carrot stick when I heard a voice addressing me through the crosstalk. Is anyone sitting here? I looked up to see Serge, lunchbox in hand. I smiled with my whole face and gestured to the empty chair across from mine. It's all yours. I held out some carrot sticks to him and he took one. The two girls sitting closest to us glanced Serge's way. He focused his attention on unwrapping his sandwich. Thanks for introducing me to Grand Louise yesterday, he said before taking a bite. That was cool. I pointed a broken off piece of carrot at him. You can thank me at my audition later today, I said. I got you, he said again, just like he had yesterday. I rested a hand over my heart. I appreciate that. For the rest of our lunch period, Serge and I cracked jokes and I told him all about Tropperville's carnival. Some things, like the steel pan band competition, were similar to the carnival on the Mother Wiles. Other details, like the parade of huge trucks carrying ginormous stereo speakers, were different. It's going to be absolutely ramping, said Serge. Ramping? What does that even mean? One of the girls at our table asked Serge. She and her friend weren't twins, but they were close. They even had identical hairstyles, but with a twist. One had a long side braid going to the right, and the other had it going to the left. They both grimaced at Serge. Yeah, that accent is so weird, said the girl with the braid going to the right. No offence, added left braid, but it sounds nothing like the rest of Tropperville. I felt my temper rise. Whoa, didn't your mamas ever teach you two about manners? No one's talking to you, auntie, right braid said spitting back the insult kids tossed at me because they thought I acted like an old judgy ant. Everyone at the table stopped chatting and turned their attention to us. Is that the best you can come up with? I jumped to my feet, annoyed. Why don't you try something new, like apologising for being so rude? White Braid frowned, a fake, soppy look in her eyes. Oh, auntie, are you afraid we've hurt your nephew's feelings? Her friend laughed and they high-fived each other. I rolled my eyes and turned to Serge. Just ignore them, Serge flashed me a look. I don't need anyone to defend me, he said. I was only trying to help. Auntie to the rescue, giggled Left Braid. Some of the kids at the next table over chuckled with her. Serge fixed his face to give them all an icy stare, but when he met their amused or pitying expressions, he looked away. He stood and picked up his lunchbox. Leaving so soon? Right Braid asked, her voice peppered with faux concern. Yeah, this place isn't ramping enough for me he said his voice, lilting with a heavy sing-song island accent. A big part of me wanted to apologise and escape with him, but he looked like he needed space. From me. Anyone understand what he said? One of the side braids asked the table. Something about someone camping or maybe rapping. I wanted to put everyone around me in their place, but they would just accuse me of playing anti to Serge again. So instead, I stood up, tossed my lunch, and left the cafeteria without another word. Every time I crossed paths with Serge for the rest of the afternoon, he walked as far away from me as possible. 
In class and in the halls, he avoided my apologetic gaze. After the dismissal bell, I waited for him at my locker, but he never showed. So many faces floated by, but none of them were his. A few people noticed me waiting and murmured to each other. Today's blow-up clearly still echoed around the walls. I couldn't wait for Serge much longer and still make it to my audition on time. When it looked like he wasn't coming, I headed for the exit. A few speed walking paces later, I felt a familiar twinge in my ankle. Oh no, it was back. How will Josie and Serge's audition go? Find out in The Sound of Magic, Book 3.